I hope you enjoyed this moment with us. And if you are our constant viewer, we like to appreciate you and we want to encourage you. Keep visiting, keep coming. We are here for you. If today is your first time um, tuning in, we'd like you to subscribe, to like, and to share this very video that you are watching. I believe very well that there are people in your contact that would like to hear this message. What is being talked about today. The blessing that you have had today, I hope there are people in your life that you want to share with and I'd like you to do that one. Praise God. How many of you are ready for the word of God? Yeah. If you are ready for God's word, put your hands together for Jesus now. Amen, 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 amen. Now we're going to look today at what the Bible talks about. When, what does the Bible say about self-denial? What does the Bible say about self-denial? And this message... I know it's going to conflict most of the things that you have learned and that the, the world have taught you. I just want you to just allow this message to go down in your heart. I really want you to allow this because it's going to conflict many, many things that the world is, is taught us. Many things. The Bible talks to us about self-denial and what does that mean? But in the first place, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever intentionally given your life to Jesus? Because there are many Christians that are Christians by default. You can't remember when you decided to follow Jesus. Because you were born in a Christian home, they drag you to church, you went to church, and then you came and connected with few friends, and then now the church has become like a little club where you know you have to come and meet your friends. But when did you give your life to Jesus? Can you remember when you intentionally gave your life to Christ? Because if you don't remember when you intentionally gave your life to Christ, you will not be intentionally committed to transformation. Because you don't know. But it's important for you to answer this question for yourself. When did I really give my life to Jesus? Did I really give my life to Jesus or I just followed the flow? Sit with this question and think about it. Because the reason why a lot of Christians are not growing is because they don't know when they gave their life. They can't remember the experience. They can't remember what really happened for them to decide that I want to give my life to Jesus. They cannot remember what happened. And this question is very important for you. Think about it. If you have not given your life to Jesus intentionally, if you've just moved by the flow, today, do that. So you write it down. You begin to mark your growth from this moment. Amen? Today, the reason why our Christian life is motivated by selfishness and greed is because we have really not given our lives to Jesus. Christianity today is motivated by selfishness. We run after, you're going to have that. You're going to have that. You're going to have that. Everything is just a self-centered. Messages preached are self-centered messages. Songs written are self-centered songs. Songs that encourage you to live in sin and still feel that it is okay. Today, the messages of repentance is always talking about someone. If you pass to preach a message of repentance, the messages about sanctification is always attacking someone. If you pass to preach is there. The messages about justification 
through the power of Christ, righteousness, and self-denial, is always taken as pastor is talking about me. But yet still, we hope to be transformed without the power that transforms us. And it saddens me. We are in a very critical time, church. Few years from now, we will be marking the 2,000 years from Pentecost. And there is a move around the world that something significant is going to happen in churches. Whatever reason you are coming to church for, make up your mind and be true and real. I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you. Today, Christianity is not different from non-Christians. What difference is your life from the other person? Let's be honest. What's the difference? What is the difference? What makes people to look at you and say, that is a Christian? She is a Christian. He is a Christian. What makes people to walk in your home and know that they have entered in a home of a Christian? They can't just do anything, say anything, do whatever. What makes people see your children and know that that child there comes from a Christian home? We want to fit in, but it's a big mistake because we are never called to fit in. We have a life given to us with specifications and the way we should live it. From our individual life to our family life to our marriages, everything is so specified, you can't miss it. You can't miss it. Everything is so specified in the way that you cannot miss it. If you truly want to live as a Christian, whether you are a husband or a wife, a child, a leader, it's so specific that if you choose to follow the path of Christ, you cannot miss it. The reason is that you have not decided to follow Jesus. That's why we don't sing the song today, I have decided to follow. We have not decided. We just follow him, but with no decision behind him. If transformation is something you are seeking for, I want to tell you it's not a miracle. It's a process. If transformation is what you are seeking for, you are praying, fasting for you to be transformed, it's not going to happen like that. Transformation is a process you go through. And you must be intentional and choose to go through a transformative life. Christianity is a choice that you make to live a certain life. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say Christianity is a choice. You make it to live a certain life. The bad news though is that the life you have chosen to live by by being a Christian, the world does not like it. All your friends around you, they don't like the life you have chosen. If you have chosen it. But because many have not chosen the life, it's hard for them to separate themselves from certain things and certain people because they've not made the choice. (coughs) Christianity is a choice for you to live a certain way. And the bad news is that the way you have chosen to live is a way contrary to what this war has projected. That's the sad bit. That's the sad bit. It's sad because today the world teaches us rejection is that depression, reject. 
But the Christian life will bring that to you. The Christian life will make people to reject you. Jesus did not hide it. He said they will reject you for me. So when their friend rejects you, and you are beat up, and you are indoors for six days, you are depressed. But Jesus said, if you choose to follow me, you will be rejected. So how did you make the decision to follow Jesus without accepting that you will be rejected? This is the confusion that we carry today. But I pray that today, if you've never made your life to follow, the decision for you to follow Jesus, that today you will follow him. You will decide to choose him as your Lord and Savior and ask yourself, what does it mean to be a Christian? I tell you something, a mind that is governed by the flesh will die. A mind that is governed by the flesh will die. A mind that is governed by the spirit will live. What does it mean for your mind to be governed by flesh? Galatians chapter 5, I will tell you the fruits of the flesh. If you want to know that your mind is governed by the flesh, those fruits I'm coming to talk about, if you fall into them, just know that your mind is governed by the flesh. But let me read the scripture first. Galatians 5, verses 19 to 21. The act of the flesh is called the act of the flesh. obvious. It means <laughs> you can see it. Sexual immorality, impurity. What? Okay. Let me read from that because you know. Sex, I mean, uh, sexual immorality, impurity, I mean, what is what's that? Debauchery or debauchery? Come on, let's go. Adultery, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fit of rage, selfishness, ambition, selfish ambition, essentials, factors, fashions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, can you put the PowerPoint for me, please? How do you know that your life is governed by the flesh? How do you know that your life is governed by the flesh? Don't fool yourself because you come into church that you dressing nice, you singing, you in the choir, or you are a leader, or you are doing. Don't fool yourself. That is all covered. Can I have the PowerPoint there, please? I gave it before. We're going to look at these things that will show every Christian that your life is governed by flesh. It's not governed by the Spirit of God. That your life is governed by flesh, not the Spirit of God. And the reason for this is important for you to know these things so that you will know where you are at, so I will know where I am at. So every Christian will know where they are at, so that we are not just carried away, so that we don't just come to church and make ourselves believe that we are Christians. That we will know it's important for you to know. It's very important. Let me tell you this. It's good to come to church. It's one of the recommendations that God gave us. It's good to dress nicely. It's good to have all this nice stuff. God loves it. None of those things, though, make you Christian. 
None of them make you Christian because today looks like the church is some a little bit of a, a beauty pageant. We come, we dress nice, but we're living a life of the flesh. We're living a life of the flesh. Sexual immorality. What is that? Anything that has to do with sexual connections. Pornography. Masturbation. Dressing in the way that you are, you know that this dress is a show off. It does not honor me. Anything that has to do, that has a sexual connotation attached to it, particularly if you have now come to God, I can understand if you have not yet given your life to Christ. But if you have given your life to Christ, piercing there, piercing on the other side, showing where this other piercing, all of that is called sexual immorality. Why? Because you are doing that to entice certain things or certain people. If you just come to church, that's okay if you've not given your life. But after you have given your life, one year, two years, three years, you still carrying piercing all over the place, and you know those places that when you went for the piercing, where the pierce you wherever it is, your motive for it is a sexual one. The motive behind it, people will say it's fashion, is that the motive is for you to show so when people see it, they are attracted to you. That intention is the act of the flesh. Define it any way you want to define it is your problem. <laughs> but God knows why you did it. And as a pastor, I'm telling you the motive why you did that. Why should anybody come to church? You show that part, you show the other part, you show this other part. Why? It's sexual immorality. Sometimes I see our young people moving, they say it's a fashion. Fashion that brings disgrace on you, don't do it. It's not a fashion. It's not a fashion for you if you have given your life to Jesus. It's no longer a fashion for you. Because giving your life to Jesus is to living a certain life. That is what it is. You choose to live a certain life. In purity. Sometimes you hear what Christians say. Their mouth is full of impure talk. You can't believe when you when some Christians open their mouth, you can't believe that they've ever confessed Christ. You can never believe it. In pure life, a life that does not glorify God in every way or form, it brings no glory absolutely to God. That is an impure life. And tell me the difference today from the church and the world. In fact, the people in the church, they will say, I will show you my other side. <laughs> you can't give your life to Jesus and have another side. You have only one side. I will show you my other side. People, Christians, they use the word, I will show you my other side. And they really have another side because when you see them in church, it's in their divinity. You go back to their homes in their humanity, you will not believe that this is the same person. You will not believe. You will not believe that this is the same woman. You will not believe that this is the same man. In church, it's all our divinity. We smile, we laugh, hallelujah. Praise God, this, that, brother, this, brother. But when you go home, you will ask yourself, is this... Let me tell you, it's not right. Christianity is a decision you make. 
a complete decision for transformation, complete and total transformation. It's a decision you make. Pleasure seeking. Pleasure seeking. Pleasure seeking. Total irresponsibility. Lack of self control. Just seeking pleasure. That's not a Christian life. Sometimes I feel sorry when I see people, how they crave for pleasure. Your pleasure as a Christian is a different one. It's in the Lord. It's in the Lord. Witchcraft. When we talk about witchcraft, people think there are three dimensions of witchcraft. I'm not going to talk about that number one day God will give the grace for me to talk about. There are three dimensions of witchcraft. Inside witchcraft itself, there are three levels of witchcraft. In witchcraft itself, there are three things you will know. Whether it is, they call this witchcraft the act of the flesh. This is not when someone go and, 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 and it, how do you call it? Someone go and, 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 and fly and go and, and just get themselves wanting to be a witch, wanting to have power. This witchcraft here is not that type of witchcraft. This is an act of the flesh. The act of the flesh witchcraft. I will talk about that next time. But witchcraft, the, the pinnacle of the act of the flesh witchcraft is that wanting, is that place of manipulation and power. That is the act of the flesh. Manipulate and power. This other witchcraft is that type of witchcraft. You want to manipulate people and be in that place of power. And I'm sorry if this is going to offend someone. That's why most of the time when you are praying against witchcraft, most of the time, women will manifest more. This is the type of witchcraft they carry. Manipulation and control. I'm speaking to you out of experience, not that I am having a go at any woman. I don't think that is here. But there are a lot of people who are, who are, who are, who are involved in this, who have been controlled by this, by this witchcraft, the act of the flesh, but they don't know that they are. They don't know. It's not that they know. They do not know that they are manifesting witchcraft as the act of the flesh. You don't fly. You don't try to like harm someone for them to die. No, that's not this type of witchcraft. A different type. Hatred. Hatred is the act of the flesh. Hatred. Hatred. Some people they just have that. As a Christian, they just hate. Like you can see in their eye. If God could only reveal their hearts, it's dark. They hate someone. <laughs> You are controlled by the flesh. Discord. Discord. Everywhere they go, create confusion. Always discord. It's an act of the flesh. It means your mind is governed by the flesh. Jealousy. 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 This is a big thing, an act of the flesh so jealous is they are eating you you see someone jealous is there it's an act of the flesh my submission today to you is I don't want any clap from anybody I don't want anything is that you will consider am I acting is my mind controlled by the flesh or by the spirit of God? That's all, I'm, that's all I need from you. As you see these things, don't think about someone, think about yourself. 
Don't think about that, that sister. That, no, no. Think about you. Is my mind controlled? Because sometimes the moment preaches that will begin to think about people. But think about you first. Think about you first. Think about you first. Jealousy. Feet of rage. Anger. Some Christians, if you meet them displaying, <laughs> you will ask yourself. And some of these displays to their wife and their husband, my God, come this like this break things. That's not a Christian. That's not a Christian. That's not a Christian. Selfish ambition. Everything they do is motivated by self. You have something. Ambitious. Ambition is good, but when it is selfish, it's dangerous. It's good to be ambitious. Aim for the highest. Aim for the best. But when it is selfish, when whatever you do is for you to gain, you are, you, are, you are controlled by the flesh. You are controlled by the flesh. Disagreement. Everywhere they are the one that disagree. I, and they take pride. I disagree. I disagree. I disagree. You have to be disagreeing all the time. You are controlled by the flesh. Factions. Those lead to everywhere you go, division. Small, small. Anybody you see that like encouraging these little groups, they are a problem. Everywhere. They go wherever they go, they have this small group. They, are, they want to control, they want to talk, they want to manipulate. That's why this little group fashions splitting. Wherever you go, your aim is to split and create your own thing. That is the act of the flesh. There are people who are very good at that. But if they want to be very nice at it, we the Kenyans, we the Zimbabweans, when we come here, we have come from different communities. We have come from different communities. If you want to be part of your community, your community is there. But when we come here, we are part of one community, the community of Jesus Christ. Why did you, if you want community people, you know where your community people are. You go there. It's only them that you're going to see there. But when you come to church, it's not about community. It's about one community that is the community of faith. What brought us together as Christians is faith, is Christ. So when we meet here, it's about Christ. It's about Christ. But there are people who are wise to split. Because when they call their nationality, immediately people succumb to that. Sometimes people ask me, who are you? I say, it doesn't matter. Whether I'm sure in life, it doesn't matter. What matters is I'm a pastor of this church. That's what matters. Everybody here that's, is as important to me as everyone. Even one nationality in this church is important to me than the one at a hundred. Division is an act of the flesh. It's an act of the flesh. It's an act of the flesh. Envy. Envy. Envy is one of the most negative feelings anybody can ever have. Oh, envy can destroy. Envy. Anything you are envious about, you will not have it. Because envy creates a blockage between you and that which you want. When you appreciate things, you have them. Or there are people my God, their envy cannot even allow them to sleep. Can't. It's an act of the flesh. 
is an act of the flesh. Drunkenness. This include all manners. Alcohol, drugs. It's an act of the flesh. It's because you want to, you, your flesh is driving you. Your flesh controls you. Orgies. These are wild. So, you know those parties where we go. Characterized by excessive leisure. Where people lose themselves. Drunkenness, all kinds of drugs. And sometimes you go to those places. You go to those places where they have those huge, big parties. Like big parties. Where anything you see there is completely perverse. And you go to those places, you still find people who call themselves Christians there. It surprises me. So, oh my God. How many years you can still come to these places? It's not for you again. It's not for you. The one who give their life to Jesus, this is not for you. It's not for you. They go to parties. This musician is coming from which country? The musician is singing no clothes, pant here. And a Christian is standing there. And this musician is going, showing their, their nakedness, doing this one, wasting wine on them. And they are there dancing. Check your life. Check your Christian life. You have not decided to be a Christian. You cannot decide to be a Christian and be in those places. It can't work. It cannot work. You are a Christian by default, not a Christian by decision. It cannot work. Because I want to really, listen, when Jesus comes, he's going to ask me, what did you teach my people? To me, that is the concern for me at this point. It's not a full church. The concern is that I stay clear with the Lord. That's all I am, I'm concerned about. Those who the Lord will bring, he will. And those who seek righteousness, they will find a place to be righteous. Lose for the sake of Christ. He said, Paul is saying, what is more, I consider everything a lose because of the surpassing worth of knowledge, of knowing Christ, my Lord. For those sake, I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. This is, this is Paul speaking. You put yourself in this man's shoe. You put yourself in the shoe of plus in the, in the shoe of Paul. For those sake, I have lost everything. Most of us, we are not willing to lose anything. We are not willing to lose even a friend. We are not willing to lose. We are not willing to lose anything, but we still want to follow Jesus. You cannot follow Jesus if you are not willing to lose the most important things you think are right. Paul lost everything. He said for the sake you are not willing to follow. Christians are not willing to lose anything. They're not willing to lose nothing. They're not willing to lose their, their position. They're not willing to lose those friends. They're not willing to lose that dress. They're not willing to lose that shoes. They're not willing to lose anything. They want to grab everything. Hold it on and follow Jesus. You can't. You can grab everything, holding it on and following Jesus. Some of your friends cannot follow Jesus with you. Some of your clothes, you cannot follow Jesus with them. Some of your shoes, you cannot follow Jesus with them. Some of the things you eat, you cannot follow Jesus with them. Some of the words you say, you cannot follow Jesus with them. Some of the way you act, you cannot follow Jesus with them. You can. Following Jesus is a certain life different from the life you ever think you know is a life of denial is a life of denial is a life of denial and until you can come to this point 
You cannot ask Jesus for anything and think that he's just going to give it to you. Because today this is what Christianity is all about. We just come, we ask for that, 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 we ask for that. We just ask him for stuff. But we're not willing to live for him. We're not willing to live for him. We're not willing to live for Jesus. We're not willing to live for him. We want to carry him. We want to carry all the other stuff and follow him. It does not work. It does not work. And the Bible says, finally, take up your cross daily. Every day is a day for the cross. Every day you're going to meet with those people. Every day you're going to go at that workplace. Every day you're going to have those friends. Every day you're going to decide. Every day you're going to talk to someone. Every day you're going to respond. Every day. If the Bible says that this cross is an everyday cross. You wake up in the morning. You feel it. It's there. You check. Am I still in check with Jesus? Is there anything in my heart? Is there anything I'm carrying that I'm not supposed to be carrying? Is there anything I'm wearing that I'm not supposed to be wearing? Is there anything I'm eating that I'm not supposed to be eating? Is there anything that I'm carrying every morning? You wake up, you check. Is the cross still there? It's not a one-off thing. It's every day, church. Following Jesus is every day. When you see people choose to follow Christ and they are walking with Jesus, it's not that all looks well for them. It's not that people are not tearing them and people are not doing stuff. It's the fact that the choice they have made is to follow him. And they choose to follow him in all the ways that they can. Regardless of what people do, do, do say whatever it is, the cross is there. Every day, they choose. I want to, just want to encourage you, church. I don't know, but... I just feel that we are not living as Christians. When I say we are, I don't mean like this church. Or maybe we are involved too. But Christians who call themselves Christians, there is no difference. There is no difference. Check our lives. Check our homes. Check what we say. Check what we eat. Check how we relate with people. Check how we commit ourselves to things. We're not living for Jesus. We are not. We are not. We shouldn't fool ourselves. We shouldn't follow those songs that makes us feel good. That makes us feel that we can live in sin and follow him. No. Today I want to call. I know we've gone far beyond time. But you know the call I want to make today? Who will decide to follow Jesus? Who will decide to follow? That today you make a decision. That today I choose to follow him. And this choice is going to be backed up. With a life of transformation. That every day. I know the world has not promised me. God has not promised me the bed of roses. But he's promised that he's going to be with me. And I want to walk with him. Some of you sitting down here. You are first generation Christians. You know what that means? You are the first person in your family to be a Christian. You know why you are? You need to deal with all those things we mentioned. That you don't leave them in your family. You need to deal with all and it begins with you. All of those things we mentioned. Impurity, sex, all those things. You need to deal with them because you are first generation. That's your job. You clear everything. You clear everything. Some of us are second generation of Christians. But it looks like we are first. Because our parents, now they didn't live for God. We know that. But you are the one who will make that intentional decision to live for him. Will you do that today? You know, a couple of Sundays, Brother Isaiah was preaching here. And he mentioned about his father. He was a Christian. He's a Christian. But he knows and there are certain patterns he needs to change. Because even though his dad was is a Christian, but he knows his dad did not live the life of Christ. And some of us, we come from families that are like that. You were born in a Christian home. 
But there was nothing there. You saw what your parents did. They gossip. They talk about people. They tear people. They destroy people. They did everything. And now you come again. You want to do the same thing. You don't want to clear the ground for your own children. You saw them. They drank. They had liquor. He said, occasionally. How can you be an occasionally Christian? Follow him once and for all. There is no occasionally. Today is my call. Who want to follow Jesus? Who want to decide today and say, today I decide to follow Jesus? Let us please stand on our feet. Separate yourself, church. Separate yourself, church. Today, this is going to be a public one. If you choose to, if you are in this room today, and you've never intentionally given your life to Jesus, but you've been going to church for so long, but you can really remember when you gave your life to Jesus, you did not make an intentional decision, you were just pulled in. Can we kneel at the, at the altar today and say, Jesus? Even if it is one person, at least that person will decide today for a transformative life. Walk to the, court, to the altar and make an intentional surrender to Jesus. Make an intentional surrender to Jesus if you are in this room today. An intentional surrender to Jesus. An intentional surrender to Jesus. An intentional surrender to Jesus. I just like to bless you before I can leave you. I pray that the Lord will honor you. I pray that the Lord will increase you. The Lord will bless you. And I pray that God will give you the grace to accelerate into whatever he is calling you into doing. I pray that the grace and the glory of God will settle upon you this year. I pray that the Lord will give you an advantage over your enemy. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I decree in your life that God himself will go before you. I decree that your going out and your coming in this year shall be blessed. I decree that the Lord will honor you and he will set his glory upon you. I prophesy that God will set a pathway before you and he will make paths straight before you. And I speak that any weapon that is formed against you will not prosper. And I pray that any tongue that rises against you will be judged by God himself. I pray that crooked paths before you will be made straight. The Lord bless you and the Lord enlarge in your territory and increase your coast. May the Lord himself shine his continent upon you. May his face radiate upon you. And may the Lord be gracious to you. Thank you so much for being with us today. I truly honor and I appreciate your time. And I'm looking forward to seeing you another time. God bless you. Bye.